Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining my talk. Thank you for introducing me. Katarin Tudose from Romania, so I came from pretty close here. I was able to drive to Sofia. Welcome to my talk, Integration Testing with Spring. My current work is uh, in Luxoft company, which is also present here in uh, Sofia as a Java and Web Technologies expert and Java chapter lead. Most of uh, the time I do teaching, creation of courses, providing expertise coaching. Uh, I'm also the author of six courses and one project at Pluralsight, mostly on testing and spring, so it is related just to our topic today. <coughs> and uh, these two books that were mentioned, Jamit in Action, that uh, was published in <coughs> November 2020, and this book about Java persistence, which is currently under print, will be ready in summer or fall at some time. Okay. About testing. We would like to define something about uh, testing and to place our topic of integration testing from today in its right place. And what you see here is called pyramid strategy. So you would like to test your application in some layers, starting from the ground, where we have those unit tests. And when we talk about unit tests, we mostly talk about methods, about classes, <coughs> about something unit. And on top of it, we introduce integration testing. Your application and your classes and your packages will not work in a vacuum, but they will have to integrate with something from the outside, most likely with services, with databases, and you are going to see that we have a lot of coding of examples, demonstrations, to integrate our application with a database. And on top of it, we have system testing and acceptance testing. System testing is dealing with the whole system to have uh, the correct functionality of uh, the whole system, and acceptance testing is dealing with what the user is, is expecting because the user has some expectations uh, of the application doing this or that, being interactive, solving his or her problems. Just to define this uh, pyramid for the testing strategies, and we are going to focus at the level of the integration testing. And we would like to bring our tests to the safety of the unit tests. So we would like our integration tests to get closer to the idea and to the safety of the unit tests. When you are in unit tests, you don't depend on outside things. So you are on the safe side. And if your tests are failing, you know that they are failing for some reason inside your code. And we would like to move to integration testing to integrate our application with a database and see how things are going and how we can manage this integration testing. It's also about Spring. And uh, we are going to use this Spring test context framework. It's generic. It's annotation-driven integration testing support, meaning it does not uh, care about uh, the testing framework. We write here that it is agnostic of the testing framework. Of course, we chose one testing framework, and probably it was a very good choice to use JUnit 5, which is the most recent of the most popular uh, unit testing framework, JUnit. And I prepared here for our demonstrations uh, some uh, applications that we are going to introduce, have a little uh, look at them. It's about persisting some uh, entities. So we have this uh, entity user, and we have also this entity log. And we would like to persist to send to a database information about users and information about logs. And in order to do this, we uh, created these uh, repositories. As long as they are extending this uh, JPA repository, it means that some methods are already available. I can. Uh, directly call this use repository to save some uh, information, to find some information. I generified here 
JPA repository by user and long end. This means that I am dealing with a database and I am dealing with uh, entities of type user having uh, primary keys or IDs of type long. And we would like to do some testing. I also prepared here the database, so from time to time we are going to have a look at it. And I will make the, I will execute the first test. That is doing something simple. It is saving uh, a user to a repository, then it is querying the database, sees that uh, you have only one user and you have some data inside it. So I'm expecting that if I am running this again and again, I will always be on the safe side and my test will work. But let's say if it works twice, let's use this nice feature of JUnit 5, which is a repeated test. So I say if I was running that test twice in a row, I will say let's make it a repeated test. It will be executed twice. And I'm expecting to be successful, but you see, for the second repetition, I'm failing. Second repetition is failing, saying, I was expecting one entity in your database, but actually I found two. What is happening, in fact? What is happening, in fact, is that when I execute this repeated test, after the first execution, something remains dirty behind the execution of the test. So I'm not on the safe side. My tests are not so safe as unit tests. And here, my test is failing because the first, the, my, my second test is failing because the first test left something behind it. And even if my test and my code are fine, we are depending on the content of the database, and we left something behind us, so we do not integrate fine with the database. We would like to have a look at alternatives about how to deal with it, how to deal with this situation. I was talking about the Spring Test Context Framework, and we have this annotation called Dirty's Context that we are going to use in order to say that our Spring application context has been dirtied during the execution of a test and should be closed. So whenever you, <coughs> when you run the test, you have to close the, the context and reinitialize it. So I will let this repeated test, and here, I'm going to say dirt is context and execute, reinitialize the context after each test method. So if I am having this repeated test twice, you see now I am on the safe side because the context has been reinitialized after the execution of the test and we start with a fresh context. Our tests do not influence each other, and what one test leaves behind it will not influence what the other test will find. How does the uh, dirtiest context work, in fact? You see here <coughs> that we have a loop for the dirtiest context functionality. So we create the context and cache, inject dependencies, we execute some lifecycle uh, methods, the test method itself, and then we remove the cached context. And this, of course, comes at the price. Because when you reinitialize the context, it will take some time. And if we would like to see something more here, you see, when I inserted this dirty uh, execution, if I'm looking here in the log, I'm going to see this Spring Boot banner once, 
and this Spring Boot banner twice for each of the execution of the tests. So this means I reinitialize the context. So this comes at a cost. So we will look for some uh, <coughs> alternatives of how to bring our tests on the safe side without, <coughs> without this dirty context annotation. And one other uh, possibility is to use transactional test. What does it mean? You see here that I annotated my test with uh, transactional. So this means that everything that we are doing within a test is transactional. And at the end of the execution of the test, that transaction will be rolled back, leaving nothing behind it. This is because of a listener that uh, we are going to come back to a little later. Yes. But how we approached this uh, second thing is, OK, I forget, at least for the moment, for this dirty context annotation. I annotate this with transactional. And I have also this repeated test twice. So I'm practically executing the same test with the same entities. Twice here. OK, so I have here repetition one, repetition two, and I don't reinitialize the context. What uh, I would like to see here is that the transaction is active or not. So I uh, inserted something in the logs to see when the transaction. So before the execution of all tests, the transaction is not active. Before the execution of the, it, it is started, yes. So we may follow if a transaction is active inside the execution of our test. And I was saying that at the end of the execution of each test, the transaction will be rolled back. OK. Is this more convenient? We may ask ourselves, is this uh, more convenient or how can we compare with uh, the execution of uh, the dirtiest context? And uh, what is important is that the transaction is rolled back at the end of each execution. But it also has its pitfalls. And let's provide here a clear example. I go back here and I say, OK, I uh, insert it here in the execution of the test. This piece of code, when you see I am calling a transactional method from a separate user service. This is a method, and it is annotated with transactional. And by default, if I don't provide any other propagation options, it will mean that the transactional method will be propagation requires. So it means that if I arrived here with a transaction, and from here, I already arrived with a transaction. I will continue with the same transaction. I will be here inside the same transaction. And at the end of the execution of this test, that, the, that single transaction will be rolled back, leaving us on the safe side. We have a test, transaction, it is executed, verify at, at the end of the execution, it is rolled back. But I can do something more here to force my luck and to demonstrate that also using transactions and uh, the transaction annotation has its pitfalls. I can say here, transactional propagation, propagation requires new. I will re-execute this test.
Remember, it's executed twice. And you see here now the second repetition fails. And if I look here in the log, I will see that there will be one more, one more record that remained here because something happened. So we have, I have one more record from that transaction, separate transaction that was not rolled back. What did it happen, in fact? We have here some explanation. So you see, I'm having this time two transactions. Remember that method I annotated with transactional and propagation requires new. And my transaction one was the transaction from the test. I separately launched in execution that transaction two that was doing its job. But at the end, it was not rolled back. It was committed. It was a separate transaction outside the control of the testing framework. And it was committed and left some row behind it. Then we came back to the transaction one that was initially suspended. And we arrived at the end of the test, finding one more row beside it. And this is the cause of what our tests are failing. Because even if I use transactional, I have to make sure that I'm managing transactions the right way, that all test is within one single transaction, and that transaction is rolled back at the end of the execution of the test. So there are also pitfalls here when we talk about transactions. Of course, if we compare uh, Dirty's context with transactional from the point of view of uh, the execution times, <coughs> and uh, I uh, did this both for MySQL and for H2, you see here that there is a clear time execution difference. So you see <coughs> the times for Dirty's context, you see the times for uh, transactional, and the time difference. But the time difference is pretty constant. Why? Because, because it does not depend on the number of the rows, but it depends on the number of the tests. So if I repeat the test 10 times, I will have a pretty constant difference, no matter how many rows I am working with how many rows I save in the database and I check. And the same thing for H2. We have a clear more, a clear more time execution for Dirty's context, while transactional is, of course, more efficient from the point of view of the execution time with the risks that uh, I was mentioning before. And the difference between the execution times is dependent on the number of tests and not on the number of the rows. So most likely, you are going to prefer transactional. If you would like to work with uh, Dirty's context, probably you will work it locally and will not push your code on a continuous integration, continuous deployment machine, because it will take a lot of time to, to run all tests. But we demonstrated that we have these ways of being on safe side and to integrate correctly with the database. Remember, we would like to run our tests. And if something fails, we would like to know that something is wrong within my code and not within some external factor like a database. So we would like to depend on our code, we would like to test our code, and we would like not to be influenced by the outside conditions, or to reduce these outside conditions as much as possible. Here, we have some uh, more annotations that are from the Spring uh, Test uh, Context Framework. 
and we would like to have another look at them. So, uh, here you see that uh, I created another test that I'm repeating twice. And I would like to demonstrate the usage of these annotations before transaction, after transaction, and commit rollback. So first of all, I would like to demonstrate that whenever I say before transaction and after transaction, I am outside the transaction. The transaction was not started yet. And this is demonstrated by the fact that I introduced these assumptions. So here I say you shouldn't be in a transaction. And here, after transaction, I'm saying again <coughs> you shouldn't be inside the transaction. OK? Uh, but what may happen wrong here? If I am doing some operation against the database outside the transaction, let's presume that by mistake, I introduce this log repository safe and I'm introducing there some rows. If I'm going to execute this test, it's fine. It does not fail. I have no sign of something ha happened. But if I check here what is left in the log table, I see that behind my test, something was left by mistake, some records, and they shouldn't be there. Whenever I execute, I should leave everything behind just the way it was before. Why did it happen? Because, as I was saying, I was executing some save operations with uh, this log re repository. Log is another entity than uh, user, before and after the transaction. So I should be aware, don't do anything to interact with the database outside the transaction as long as I chose to work transactionally. Because now my tests are working, and this is the bad thing, because <coughs> I left something behind, and I'm not aware, I may not be aware of something left dirty behind my execution. Something more that uh, we would like to say here is about uh, rollback commit uh, annotations that uh, are also uh, provided by the Spring the Test uh, Context Framework. By default, as I was saying, whenever I execute a transactional test, it will be rolled back at the end. But I can force things to be committed either by saying, commit or saying rollback value false. It's absolutely the same thing. And if I am re-executing now the test, it fails because this test committed what it was doing at the end of the execution, and it left something behind it, something dirty. So, most likely, in practice, you will never force a commit for a test. We just did it for the demonstration to say, yes, you have the possibility to do this, to check, to debug maybe. But of course, for the long-running tests, you would like to be on the safe side. And You would like always your tests to be independent of the environment that they are integrating with. Always when you test your code, you would like to discover the bugs, problems in your code. 
Ok. <coughs> we'll move to some more demonstration. We are going to talk about test execution listeners. We see <coughs> here that we mentioned some uh, life cycle methods, before each, after each. These are provided by JUnit 5. Also, JUnit 5 provides methods as before all, after all. And uh, if you haven't uh, worked yet with JUnit 5, you may have worked with JUnit 4, for example, that has similar method, just anno similar annotations, just before, after, before class, after class. So <coughs> we would like to control some execution of uh, the test and come with this uh, lifecycle methods. And one alternative is to use those before each, after each annotated methods. But we have some alternative here. We have the alternative to configure a test execution listener. Why should I do that? Why or when may I prefer to use a test execution listener versus those annotations from JUnit 5? <coughs> we write here that uh, it's more flexible. What does it mean? If I have 10 tests and I want to do the same uh, operation before each of the 10 tests from the suite and test classes, 10 test classes, and then after each, I will have to do one of the two things. Either <coughs> I will have to, to put it in each test, so I will duplicate my code, or I may separate uh, these, uh, an these methods annotated with before each and after each in a class. I have to extend that class, and I can come with this tests that are extending the original class. This is not uh, so convenient because I have to hang myself in that class. And I'm uh, looking at this alternative of using test execution listener. I would like to separate the execution uh, of some uh, additional uh, method, and I would like to separate it here. And I have prepared here this uh, uh, listener test. I created here this separate database operation listener that is implementing this test execution listener. And I added here the lifecycle methods. And for the moment, I will pretend some code is not here. OK, so I will say, OK, I have a test execution listener, and I, uh, this one that I wrote here, and I'm going to annotate my uh, class with test execution listeners, database operation listeners, so that my newly added listener is executed. And if I run this listener's test, I will see that my test is failing. And if I look here, I will see, OK, this user repository is null, meaning this field that I'm trying to auto-wire is null. Why? Because as I registered my listener, some previous existing listeners are no longer registered. And we can see this here. How many listeners do we have? We have only one listener. So what I can do is that I introduce manually this dependency injection test execution listener that was previously added by the framework itself. Say, OK, let me see how it works. And now, say, OK, my test is green, but am I sure that everything is fine? If I check here, how many listeners do I have? OK, I have two listeners. But if I check uh, 
something more here. I will see that I'm not in the transaction. Even if I created this uh, test with transactional, I will need to add myself the transactional test, or better, coming back to where we started from the test as it was looking like at the beginning, to use this merge mode. I don't have to deal with, to add manually all the test uh, execution listener that I need, but I say merge mode, merge with default. So this means take the default, the already existing test execution listeners, and merge with my newly added database operation listeners. So if I execute it now, my newly added listener is there. I see now the size of the execution listener is 15 because 14 come by default and I add my own. And if I look here at uh, this uh, lifecycle methods, let's see here in the log, I will look for this. So you see that there, those methods are also executed. The methods from the listener that I wrote myself and the transaction is active. So this is one good way to work with our listeners and to merge them with the uh, existing listeners. OK. Let's go back here. And to talk something more about profiles. I would like to easily test my applications. And there may be many situations when the configuration of uh, my application may vary. The configuration of my application may vary from some profile to some other profile. An example of profile may be the profile of a developer. So I have a configuration uh, on my machine while I'm developing. I have uh, some uh, light database, for example, H2, that I'm using so that I speed up my uh, uh, my development, and whenever I move to production, I have to change the environment. I have to change, for example, to a real database like MySQL or Oracle or whatever. But I would like to, this, to do this quickly. How can I do this? <coughs> we look here to this uh, third application. It is also a, a Spring Boot application, and it's looking very close to the previous existing applications that we demoed on. But we have here, we have defined some profiles. So if I look here, I will say this is my developer profile. It means that here I am defining exactly how my environment is looking like for the developer. So I'm looking. I'm working with an <coughs> H2 database in memory to speed up the process. With these uh, credentials, I'm using this dialect. And I may <coughs> work in this situation for weeks and months. And whenever uh, I will uh, be in production, I will use this different prod profile with a different database. It is MySQL with other credentials, and here I'm expecting to use another SQL dialect, MySQL. So if I look here, you see that I have inserted the, the active profile to be the development profile, because this is what I am currently doing in my everyday work. Let's uh, see how we can run this uh, test, and how we can switch to other profiles.
I am saying here that uh, this is the dev profile. Why? Because I activated it here. And in order to demonstrate this, I can look here in the log, and I will see that whenever these uh, queries, these SQL queries were generated, it was the H2 dialect that was used. What happened, in fact, here? So we are using an ORM framework to make the connection between our object-oriented uh, world, our entities here. Remember that we're having two entities, user and log. And they have to be, the information from them, from the objects, needs to arrive to a database. And it is the framework that is translating from the world of the objects to the world of the relational databases using these SQL queries. But it has to generate somehow these SQL queries. How? It will generate them according to the configuration that we provided here, saying, I have an H2 database. So use this dialect and save everything using SQL dialect specific to H2. And I may work like this, I was saying, for weeks, maybe more. And at some time, I will move to the real production. How can I quickly switch? I can switch from here, saying just uh, I switch uh, the active profile. I will need to do something more. It is done on my side, but I would like to emphasize it. I will need the dependency for the database. You see that in my POM XML, in my list of dependencies, we have for convenience both H2 and MySQL, of course. But if you don't have one, you have to switch to the other one. And now if I am running the same test, I am saying that it is running in the production environment, meaning against the MySQL database. And if I have a look here, you see that it is using the MySQL dialect. Of course, then you will see also uh, the MySQL dependencies uh, created, uh, loaded, sorry. But it is important that we can easily switch from here. So if I go back to dev, I will be again in the H2 environment using the H2 dialect. So you see that I can test my application quickly using different environments, different profiles, by just switching the profile. And it is important to say we don't recompile the application. We don't rebuild anything. We just rerun it with a different uh, configuration. Of course, because it was mentioned also here uh, on this slide, we may use this active profiles annotation. So I can come here, and I can use it. And even here, if here I have dev, I can <coughs> override the active profile using this annotation. And let's demonstrate it. So if I go here, I'm expecting now the prod profile, and I'm seeing that I'm using the MySQL dialect. Most likely, you are going to quickly switch between profiles from the configuration because of all the advantages that uh, I was uh, saying. Quick, 
no code recompilation, no code rebuild, you will immediately be able to redo this with the condition, as I was saying, to have the correct dependencies, the correct drivers, everything that you need to interact with that respective database. And one more thing about uh, testing. We will take a quick look at uh, testing Spring REST. And uh, we'll have uh, the situation uh, to test uh, the HTTP API from the controller. So we would like to demonstrate how to test this HTTP API. But most likely, I would like to be decoupled from the server. I would like to test my HTTP API and not care about the server, about what the server does, or I would like even not to start the server. So I will move here to this application. What uh, we have here is this uh, user controller that I would like to test. Yes. So you see that uh, we are having a REST API. And this REST API is delegating to the repositories. And what I care about is to test this API, in fact, without uh, taking care about what the repository returns. Let's see what will happen if I start the application. So if I go here to local host 8081 slash users, you see that I am having a list of users that uh, my application is accessing from the database. And I was saying I would like to test it. Which are my alternatives? Now my application is started. Yes. I can test, for example, like this, executing some REST commands from this uh, client. So let's say that I am patching this uh, user, and then I am checking that it has been updated, and then I am posting a new user. I am keeping here the ID of the new user, and I'm checking that the new user has been added. Skip it, please. And so on. That's not so effective. Why? Because I have to start the application, and I need to change the content of the database. Because if I look here, user number was uh, we have here 20 users. And after executing here, we have one more user. So I'm changing the content of the database. So I'm not integrating, again, with some external service or some external database. And I will still like to be on the safe side. I would like to be more quick and more effective. And I can do something additionally here. I can test in the absence of the database. And in the absence of the application that I have just stopped, I can use this, uh, this mock MVC that I'm auto-configuring here. I also need to mock the repository and to instruct it how to do. And this mock bin is doing two things. It is mocking the repository, and it makes it a bin. So it means that it adds it to the Spring context. So it means that uh, now I would like to test only the HTTP API. I am instructing how the repository should act, I am mocking it. And then I am simulating some action 
against the HTTP API. Here, other action. Here, other action. So in the absence of the application started in the application in the in the absence of the database and without affecting the database. <coughs> so I can start this. And as I was saying, I'm testing exclusively the HTTP API. My tests are still on the safe side. My Tests do not depend on external database content, do not affect, do not depend even on the latency of the database. So this uh, comes uh, closer to our uh, end of the demonstration. So before saying uh, thank you and uh, eventually taking some uh, questions, if there is still time. Telling you, you can, if you are interested about any of my books or any other Manning books, any, any other Manning books, you can use for the period of this conference to access the link provided by that QR code and uh, with that uh, additional code for reduction, and you will get 35% reduction. You may talk to me later. You may look for me on Twitter or on uh, LinkedIn. But I th think we still have about three minutes if there are questions now or comments. Let me take some photo in this case. Thank you.